Good morning and welcome to our message this morning. On one occasion, as our Lord prepared for his crucifixion and ascension, he told his disciples, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, I give unto you. Our Lord has provided peace for a confident, enjoyable Christian life. I'll repeat that again. Our Lord has provided peace for a confident, enjoyable Christian life. When Christians feel a lack of peace or assurance in their hearts, it's not because God hates them or their church or their pastor wants them to feel miserable. But quite often it's because of disobedience and rebellion in their very own heart. Our assurance or confidence in the heart as Christians depend on two things, our relationship and obedience to God and our relationship with others. If I'm not right with God, my heart accuses me. If I'm not right with someone else, my heart accuses me. A believer's relationship with someone else can and does affect our relationship with God. In Matthew 5.23, Jesus taught the Jews that if they brought a sacrifice to the altar and remembered a sin against a brother, they should reconcile with their brother first. So an obedient Christian obeys God's commands and loves in deed and in truth. Now with obedience and love as a foundation, today we will see how a Christian can flourish in a walk of confidence toward God through our heart. So let us open God's word to 1 John chapter 3 verses 18 to 24. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he had commanded us. Whoever keeps his command abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. Let us pray. Lord, we ask you to speak to us today, not only through these words, but also in our hearts. May we surrender not only our lives, but our heart to your will and your guidance. Allow our hearts be guided by you and direct us today and every day to be able to follow in your footsteps. Lord, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing I'd like to share with us today is obedient Christians have confidence. In 1 John 3, 20 and 21, it says, For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. One of the problems I find when reading this letter and reading these particular verses is it makes you actually ask the question, Have I made any progress at all as a Christian? In my Christian life, Have I actually got any closer to God? Because in some ways it frequently reminds us of how we struggle. We find our hearts often condemn us. The fact is we know we are sinful people. Our heart knows our inner motives and how often we love or don't love our brothers or when we hold something against someone. Our hearts know things about ourselves that other people do not know. And our heart can condemn us. One of the difficulties of this is sometimes the accusations of Satan come into our lives. And we know that these accusations are false. They're not true. But when our heart condemns us, the fact is we know that they are true. Our heart is telling us the truth. It's telling us that there is a problem. Now understand that this is not a problem in itself. It is good that our heart actually condemns us. It's like 
in the physical world where we have pain receptors. When we do something wrong to our body, we have pain receptors all over our body that measures if something is wrong. And it's because of those pain receptors, we then can correct whatever we're doing. For example, if we've got our hands in hot water, it reminds us that this is not good and tells us to pull it away. But on a spiritual level, pain receptors are no good. So it's our heart that tells us what we're doing is hurting us spiritually. And therefore, having our heart condemn us is not a bad thing. It is actually a good thing. And we need to learn to listen to it and to correct our behaviours when our heart tells us that there is a problem. So John is not telling us to ignore the problem. He's not telling us to ignore the heart. He's not telling us to shrug it off. He's telling us to meet the challenge by seeing that God knows more than us. The verse says that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. He also knows where we need to be corrected. So in verse 20 we read, God is greater than our hearts. In the Old Testament, they were given the Ten Commandments on tablets. And later on, these tablets were actually put in the ark. And they carried the ark with them. And so you were constantly reminded of the Ten Commandments. And being reminded of the Ten Commandments then actually is a constant reminder of how we failed, how we don't measure up. That wasn't a bad thing. It is a reminder that we need God. And over the ark, as the way that the Jewish people saw it, was what's referred to as the mercy seat, made of a slab of gold as wide as the ark. And upon that is where God actually sat. So what I want to do is remind you that his mercy is greater than our sins. See, we have a heart that condemns us, but God's heart is bigger than our hearts. His mercy is bigger than our sins. As we're reminded of the Ten Commandments, we can imagine them sitting in the ark. And we can picture God sitting on top of the ark. But what's in between God and those Ten Commandments? Mercy. And that's what we have. God's mercy. Because he loves us. In 1 John 1 9 we read, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we know that obedient Christians can have confidence because God's heart is bigger and greater than our heart. He has mercy. But one of the other things he also has is his omniscience is greater than our hearts. In other words, he knows everything. There is nothing you can do that will surprise God. He loved you knowing that you were a sinner. When our hearts condemn us, we think that we can actually hide from God. Church is a great example. When we do something wrong in our lives, or we're doing something wrong, our hearts actually condemn us for our action, and so we try to hide. And one of the things that we do when we hide is that we try to hide from God as well by not going to church. People pull away from church. And yet, God knows exactly what you're doing. God knows what you're doing in your life and the sins that you're committing. And the very thing that you need to do, and that is be obedient to God, to come back to church and to come closer to Him, is the very much thing that you're hiding from. It's the same as Adam and Eve. When Adam ate of that apple and when God's presence arrived, he hid or tried to hide from God. That's what we do because our heart condemns us. But even though our heart condemns us, that's when God shows his mercy and justice. And we need to understand he knows it all. We need to come to him and apologize and ask for forgiveness. I just want to take a couple of minutes to make some special notes here. First of all, what is condemns? People think the word condemns means that you have had final judgment, that there is no coming back from this. Basically, that you have received condemnation, that you are going to burn in the lake of fire and sulfur, and basically you're going to hell. That's not what the word means. The word condemn here means to see accurately, to know that you're guilty, to actually judge oneself, to take a low view of. It doesn't mean you can't recover. 
In fact, your heart condemns you so you will turn around, that you will change your ways. It doesn't mean you can't come back from it. And when our heart condemns us, this is a good thing. A lot of people think, oh, my heart's condemning me, that is bad. No, this is my, my spiritual life telling me that I need to change. I can actually have confidence knowing that my heart is condemning me because I know that God is working in my life. In fact, if it wasn't condemning me, then I would have a serious problem. But the fact that it's condemning me or condemning my actions, it actually tells me that there is still hope and I have confidence that God has not given up on me and that I can change my ways. The second thing I want to share with you today is obedient Christians have confidence in the power of prayer. In 1 John 3, 21 and 22. Beloved, if our hearts does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from Him. Because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. So obedient Christians have confidence in God's heart. And secondly, obedient Christians have confidence in the power of prayer. Verse 22, and whatever we ask, we receive from him. That is a bold statement. And you need to be a confident Christian to actually live it. But you can. In Hebrews 10 verse 19, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus... So it's not self-confidence. It's not confidence that is a pride issue. It's not confidence in myself or what I've done. It's confidence firstly in Christ and in his sacrifice. And secondly, it is confidence in God's promises and his power to be able to make them happen. So if we're going to be a confident Christian in the power of prayer, we need to pray like confident Christians. Our prayers need to be concise. It actually says whatever. To be honest, my wife has taught me so much about prayer. As a Christian, I used to always pray for whatever God's will is for it to be done. And that is a good prayer. But I would be scared to ask for something for myself. My wife taught me how to pray. Not by sitting me down and teaching me, but just by simply listening to her pray and actually how God answered her prayers. One of the major lessons I learned from God through Kerry's prayers was when we were at Bible college. God was telling me to resign from Canmore Baptist Church and God would provide. But the Bible college was also closing. And so we had, I was losing my job. I was losing our house and our accommodation we were losing all security and yet God was saying I want you to leave and trust me so I had the confidence to trust God but when I listened to my wife's prayer she had the confidence to pray for the things that we need I remember listening to her asking God to provide a job and that we also needed a house it needed three bedrooms it needed to be near a school. And she was asking God of all these things specifically. Not because we wanted a big mansion or anything like that. Or, but we needed to survive to do his ministry. And she was very specific. The fact is, God answered every one of those. Within 24 hours of me resigning, God put it on another church's heart to give me a ring to see if I was interested in working for them. And through that, we then were provided a house with three bedrooms that was right next to the church because it was the church manse. And it was only 200 metres from a fantastic state school. God had answered every one of her prayers because Kerry had the confidence to ask God and to be specific. And we need to have that confidence too. Not because of God answering us, but just simply because God is a powerful, loving God. In James 4 verse 3 it says, You ask and do not receive, because you ask wrongly, to spend it on your own passions. See, our prayers are to serve God. 
Kerry didn't ask for a huge house. She didn't ask for a private school and all the funding to go to support that. We had some basic needs to be able to serve God. She didn't pray for her passions of maybe a new holiday or a new car or some new clothes. She just prayed simply for what was needed to serve the Lord. So often our prayers are, Lord, look after me, protect me. Lord, do this for me. Our prayers can be a lot more specific and a lot more powerful. We can pray in the morning to die to self, to be filled with the Spirit. For the Lordship to be over upon me in when making decisions. I can pray specifically for my family's needs. I can pray for our church's needs. I can pray for the community around us. It doesn't have to be about your passions, your wants. We pray that our needs will be met so we can fulfill God's desires. So our prayer should be concise, but there's also a condition to pray, because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. I was reading a story of a man who came to talk to his pastor about his unsaved son, and he told the pastor he had prayed, but his son had yet to be saved. And the pastor quoted Psalm 66 verse 18. If I regard inequality in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. He then told the man to check and see if there was anything in his life that was not right. The man took care of a problem with another man that he had within the church. And shortly after, his son was saved. This is an amazing story and this is one story of many where things like this have happened. I just want to be also certain to say that people, the son in this case still has a choice. You can ask God to save someone over and over again, but if that person that you're praying for continues to refuse, then that doesn't mean that they will be saved. But if we have sins in our lives, then that may prevent God from working in our lives and answering those prayers. So it's right for us to examine our lives and to see if there's anything that actually could be blocking it a friend who came up and asked a similar situation where his business was struggling and he wanted prayer for his business and he had prayed and nothing had happened my thought immediately and this was an internal thought of mine well I'm not surprised with the way that you live and the way that you do business it doesn't surprise me at all that God hasn't answered your prayers if you're cheating the system if you're cheating the taxes so if we want God to answer us, we need to place our faith in him, not in our ability to cheat. We need to trust him to answer our prayer. There is a strong link between our prayers and obedient living. I repeat that. The link between our prayers and obedient living is so strong that we must examine our lives. In John 15 verse 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So there is a link between answered prayer and obedience to God's commands and God's word. Think about this for a second. You are a parent and you have a child. And this child is being very rebellious this day. And you've taken the child to the shops and they're crying and they're screaming and protesting at every step of the way. In fact, they're having a really bad attitude day. Then the child actually sees a toy in the toy section and wants it and requests it. Ask yourself, are you inclined to oblige? Or are you inclined to actually allow that child to change their behaviour before you reward it? As parents, we know not to reward bad behaviour. I wonder how much more, consider how much more does God understand that principle than us. So obedient Christians have confidence in God's heart. Obedient Christians have confidence in the power of prayer. And obedient Christians have confidence in the presence of the Holy Spirit. In 1 John 3, 23 to 24, it reads, And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, 
just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. See, the Holy Spirit is a real person. When I say person, I'm not talking about a physical body. But the Holy Spirit is real. He has thoughts, he has emotions. It's not just simply a guiding force, but actually God guiding us. Unless you have the Holy Spirit, it's almost impossible for you to comprehend what we're talking about. A lot of people get confused with the Holy Spirit and what the world talks about today as spirit in the context of a new age. So instead of turning to God and the Holy Spirit, they see that the Spirit is more of a place to have harmony with the spirits of the world. Or if you look up the yellow pages, you'll see things like psychics or spiritual counselling, medicine card readings, aura photography, astrology, crystal readings, aura cleansing, just to name a few. All these are Satan's substitutes for prayer and the power of the Holy Spirit. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. We are told that there are counterfeits out there. We are told that people actually seek these for advice. These are a poor substitute for the real thing. It's the Holy Spirit that we are need, and the devil's tricks are to pull you away from him and listening to him. But before you can know the presence of the Holy Spirit, you must believe in the Son, Jesus Christ. John three twenty three it says, And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. That's where some people can get confused. Belief is not just knowledge. Belief must include trust, or another word that we like to use, faith. Belief doesn't always mean that you trust something. For example, I'm building some chairs out the front. And if I ask the question, how many people in this church, or do you believe that I can build some chairs? The majority of you would say yes. Some, like my wife, who knows my ability, may question me. But then... To say that you believe that I can build the chairs and actually trusting in the chair that I've built by actually sitting on it, that's a different matter. To believe one is one thing. To place your weight and your trust in something is different again. And that's what we are called to do. Not only to believe in the Son of Jesus Christ, but to place our trust in Him for our eternal salvation. So the belief that we're talking about here in the Bible is that belief includes the idea of knowledge, but also includes the idea of trust, which is relationship. We must have a relationship with the Lord and the Holy Spirit. John three sixteen to 18 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. So you can have as much belief as you want in your crystals, or in your reflexology, or in some sort of other form of worship, because it will do you no good, because you are condemned without Christ. Because it's only Christ that has the power to save. And it is Christ that actually sent the Holy Spirit. In 1 John three twenty three to 24 it says, And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. The moment you are saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. And the moment you have the Holy Spirit, life is different. There's a presence in your life. There's... He's a guide, he's a comforter, he's an encourager. I couldn't even imagine my life without the Holy Spirit now. I don't know how we used to live without him. We have obviously did, we obviously thought that we were God. But having the Holy Spirit in our lives, being active in our lives, 
that's something different. So you have an ongoing relationship with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is within you. Now, my sin can get in the way. My sin can actually cause a distancing, a, a hindrance to the Holy Spirit and me being able to hear from him. But through the Holy Spirit, he can comfort me, he can encourage me, and therefore give me the confidence that I need to continue in my walk with the Lord. In Romans 8 verse 9 it says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. In fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. A Christian realises his confident Christian living because of the Holy Spirit. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. The Holy Spirit that lives within you is greater than any problem that you're going to face. Is greater than any sin that you've got yourself caught into. The Holy Spirit is one of the greatest gifts that we have ever been given. And we need to live closer to him and therefore live confidently with him. Now, two things could be happening right now. Firstly, if you have never been saved, your heart may be convicting you to become a Christian. If you know that you do not have the Holy Spirit, if you know that you are living a life of sin and that you have never really given your life to Christ, then the Holy Spirit may be convicting you right now telling you that it's time to come to him, to hand over your life and to place your trust in him. The fact is, your heart knows you better than I do. Your heart and the Holy Spirit are the two people who know you and you will know if you are saved or not, if you have that Holy Spirit or not. And if you're not saved, you need to be. I want you to contact me. I want you to contact one of the elders. I want you to contact someone that you can trust. Grab them and ask them to pray with you and to help you to receive God and his spirit and his gifts that he actually has for you. The second thing that could be happening is that you are saved and you're discovering that there is confidence in a powerful God. That there is confidence in the power of prayer. And there's confidence because we have the person of the Holy Spirit living within our lives. We have a powerful God who can do all things. The power of prayer where he is wanting to answer our prayers. And will just want us to walk with him. And the Holy Spirit that lives within us. So you may want to pray for freshness of that spirit, in a daily walk with him. Live a life that makes him feel comfortable with you. Live a life where the Holy Spirit is with you in presence at every stage in your life. That you feel his presence, that you come closer to him, and he comes closer to you in helping you, encouraging you, comforting you, and building you up. I want to pray that God blesses you. I want to pray that God blesses our nation. Lord, we are struggling in the sense of how to open up. Lord, economically we know that there are people struggling. Lord, we are so thankful that the pandemic hasn't gone the way it has in other countries as it is in Australia. Lord, I pray that we're able to keep this virus away. But Lord, I pray for your guidance and your wisdom for this nation and how to move forward. Lord, I pray for our churches. We haven't been able to meet. We struggle to not be able to connect with one another in person. And so, Lord, I pray for the wisdom to know when is the right time to start up and how to proceed. Lord, I pray for our families. Lord, we have loved ones that we would love to see come to the Lord or come closer to the Lord. And so, Lord, we just pray that you protect them as well. And, Lord, we pray for each other. Lord, I pray that through the Holy Spirit you will guide us and you will direct us to encourage one another, to build one another up, to comfort one another when we are sick. And, Lord, through your Spirit, Lord, you will do the same for us. So, Lord, I just pray that you bless everyone this week. And, Lord, we thank you 
for the confidence that we can have because of you and that you are working in our lives. And we thank you for this gift, the Holy Spirit, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.